Okay, uh, we'll get started. We have uh, with us today Jan Schmidt. Uh, Jan has been a G-Streamer developer since 2002 and is the current release manager. Among other things, he is responsible for G-Streamer's DVD playback. And Jan works for Sun Microsystems as a multimedia systems engineer. So welcome, Jan. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so as mentioned, I work for Sun um, in the, the thin client division where I spend about half my time working on optimizing media streaming on our remote desktop systems and about the other half of the time doing generic GStreamer open source work. And um, so this talk's titled Towards GStreamer 1.0 and it's a little bit of a retrospective of GStreamer, where it came from and then our thoughts about what its next directions are and maybe if I get time, some demos along the way. So for anyone who doesn't know, you can do the talk, so I assume most people do, but GStreamer is the multimedia framework that underlies GNOME and uh, a bunch of other media apps and is used increasingly in embedded hardware, um, like the, the Nokia N900 phones and the Palm Prees and uh, it's even been spotted on Amazon's ebook reader thing. And it's a, a framework that lets you plug together graphs of processing elements that in, in, when, when you add them up, they perform some processing steps on, a, on media. It's used mostly for multimedia, has been used for other tasks that are completely not multimedia related, like scientific data sampling and processing stuff. Uh, so, And it, it supports the whole range of multimedia apps that playback, streaming to the web, mixing and production stuff, non-linear editing. And so here's a, a brief history. It's been going since 1999. It was 10 years old in June of last year. And um, it's gone through a set of major release cycles there. Um, just, there you go, 0 0.1, 1999, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. 0.6 was about the time that it was added into GNOME. And I think the next few slides are a bit of an overview. So those first four years uh, establish the basic design of GStreamer, the idea of having plugins that supply some functionality in the form of elements, processing elements. The elements contain pads where the data flows in or out of, of the thing. Uh, it has a registry that keeps track of all the installed plugins on a system so that when you go and you replace a file on there, on the, the hard drive, the next time you run a GStreamer app, it will rescan the set of plugins, update the registry, and store that away. It used co-threading and uh, to do its uh, uh, parallel processing, and had this this concept of buffer pools for limiting, uh, restricting the memory management, pre-allocating a bunch of pools. Uh, it started appearing in, in GNOME 2.0 as early as the 0 0.4 days, but Back then, it was pretty, pretty primitive, really, and not, not particularly stable. It, w it was not until 0 0.6 that I think GStreamer actually became useful as anything more than a toy. So that was 2003, 2004. The 0 0.6 series of, of releases, which I like to think of as the point at which GStreamer became useful for doing audio playback. Uh, it's, it's when Rhythmbox was first written. And at that point, video playback was an experimental, unreliable feature where you'd frequently get synchronization losses if you paused and unpaused a video, for example, which stayed true uh, for 0 0.8 as well. So another year and a half there, 2004, 2005, at which point GStreamer was pretty good at, at audio play, well, really good at audio playback at that point. Video playback better, but, but still a bit sparse, a bit crashy, unreliable. Totem started, started having a GStreamer backend at that point. And a few of the, the content production applications started appearing. PTV is probably the one that 
many of you have, have tried and probably walked away from because um, it's, it's still a, a work in progress. The Flumotion streaming server that I and a bunch of the other GStreamer developers were working on uh, 2005 through 2007 or so um, when we were all gathered together in, in Barcelona and working for Fluendo. And the Flumotion streaming server is quite a, a capable piece of software these days. Um, I forget what the statistic is, but it's, it's streaming gigabits per second uh, in, in various places around the world and supporting a, a large number of Spanish, French, Belgian TV and radio stations as, as their method for putting their content onto, onto their websites. It's also the point at which we added the new capability system. Um, capabilities are the way in which GStreamer elements decide what data they're going to pass around and what the formats are and is how the, the underlying library can decide automatically for you, oh yes, I can plug these two components together, they have compatible capabilities, and then they'll talk amongst themselves to decide which of those they're actually going to, to pass back and forth. Uh, so, which brings us to 0 0.10, which is the current GStreamer that you probably all have installed on your laptops if you're running a, a Linux operating system. That came out in December 2005 and was the result of the fact that uh, Fluendo had enough seed capital to pull half a dozen of, of the G core GStreamer developers together in Barcelona and let us work on, on GStreamer continuously for a, a year or more and improve the design, improve the stability. So there were a lot of design changes at that point. Co-threading went out the window as, as too complex and, and hard to implement um, in the face of all the user space, all the, the external dependency libraries that we use. So we, we switched at that point to just letting the operating system decide how to schedule things. Uh, and that has been a, a good choice overall, although it does mean we have a gazillion locks. Uh, that was the point at which GStreamer started attempting to guarantee and succeeding fairly well at providing API and ABI stability. So since December 2005, there have been a couple of little rough patches, but in general, GStreamer has maintained the same API, the same ABI for, for over four years now. Um, and that was, at the, that was the point at which we split all the, the GStreamer plugins. At, before that, there, there were two GStreamer tables. We released the GStreamer core library that did the the logic of, main, of uh, putting together pipelines and shed, scheduling them and running them, and the tarball that contained all of the plugins themselves. We had one large GST plugins tarball, and so at 0 0.10, the idea was to split it into three, uh, or four, sorry. There's, there's a base, there's good, and there's bad, and there's ugly, and each of those has a rationale for, for figuring out which plugins belong in it. The basic idea is that the base plugins should provide uh, video playback functionality and, exam and an example of each type of element that, that GStreamer commonly uses and should include the base, uh, base classes and base libraries that the media processing elements depend on. So the things that exist in plugins base are Ogtheora and Vorbis support, stuff that we know can be distributed without uh, without licensing or patent problems. Then we have good, which is a similar set of plugins, but the idea is we keep base as a simple set of example plugins, and everything else that can be freely distributed goes into the good set. Bad, which are plugins that are not yet up to par, new plugins, uh, things, things where the code is, is possibly unreliable things which are eventually destined to move into one of the other modules if the code reaches a sufficient standard. We've got a checklist for stuff that, that the plugins need to have before they move. And then the ugly module, which is all the stuff that is under a, a license that people should think twice about distributing or has known problems with, with patents. It's sort of a known encumbered formats go into ugly um, so that distros can have a think about whether they care about that sort of thing, whether they should split it out into a separate location when they provide 
their packages. Uh, so here's a, here's a bit of the development uh, progress over the years. It's a graph of the number of commits in GStreamer since, it's a little hard to read, that was uh, 2000 up here at 2010 is the end of the graph. And there's a couple of interesting features there. 2005, October, is where we were all in Barcelona. This is where we split all the things up into the separate modules. So there's a bit of an artifact of a, the massive number of commits that went on or that show up in the history artificially because there's a duplicated history between the different modules. But the, I think the most interesting one is this, this bit, uh, January last year, where we switched from CVS to Git and the number of commits. Is that someone's phone ringing up here? Okay. Um, so yeah, where we switched to Git and the number of, of commits going on in our project increased exponentially. Hmm? Yeah. So uh, this is a graph of the, the amount of code that's being changed in GStreamer every month. Again, there's a decided peak where we switched to Git. So I, I think it's fair to say Git makes us a lot more productive, which is kind of, kind of cool. There's that nice peak, again, where we're in Barcelona and we were doing the, the development of the 0 0.9 uh, development series, and then we released 0 0.10, and it sort of faded down for a while with a few uh, a few intermittent peaks there, uh, some of which just reflect uh, shared history again when we move plugins between modules and we duplicate all the history over, then it shows up as, as extra development. So if there's a cycle where we moved a lot of plugins, you, you, that, that causes some of those peaks. And some of them just repre represent hack fests or uh, someone taking a holiday and having plenty of time to work. There's also this little dip at the end where uh, the, the month hasn't finished yet and Christmas is pretty slow. I haven't been doing much on GStreamer for the last eight weeks and I guess uh, either I really contribute that much or other people have also had a bit of a break the last eight weeks. Uh, and uh, and this, this one which I, I put in just to sort of show that this one doesn't actually change when we hit Git, because one theory I had was we switched to Git and people started doing a lot more smaller commits, but they, the, the commit size didn't really change in the last year, as far as I can tell. Again, there's that giant peak where we split all the plugins out, and that 0 0.10. But really, I think overall, switching to Git has made us measurably more productive. Um, it also seems to have invited at least if I, you know, in my opinion, there's a bit more of a bump there where people are finding it easier to contribute to the project. Although, as you can see, there's a generally been a nice slope of growth over the, the whole whole set. We're gradually pulling in more, more unique contributors every month, uh, every release cycle. So then, so what's been going on? The last year, we've done 38 individual module releases. Uh, as I said, we've got core, base, good, bad, ugly. We've also got a set of uh, GL-related plugins uh, and, a, and the Python bindings modules. So we've got seven different modules. The way we do GStreamer releases is, uh, well, the way I do GStreamer releases, every month, uh, two or three of those modules gets released and they roll over on a three-month cycle. So in a normal six-month distro cycle, we've got two releases of all GStreamer modules and a couple coming out every month to be bumped in. So we've been doing that, doing it that way for two years now, and it's been working pretty well. Uh, with, it, it, in fact, the only time it's fallen over has been the last two months when I moved from Dublin to Australia and so I've had all my stuff packed up and been 
completely haphazard and unproductive for the last two months and I haven't been doing the normal release cycle, which is kind of interesting because it acts as a bit of a, a what if I get hit by a bus uh, test for, for a GStreamer and it looks like what happens is no one releases stuff for two months and then in the third month they decide that I'm not coming back anytime soon and start making their own plans. So it looks like the, the monthly release cycles will be restoring themselves in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so also in the last year we switched everything over to Git, which was a, a pretty mammoth uh, exercise given that we had four, five, six CVS modules that all had manual edits, in some cases files that existed simultaneously in, in as a deleted and a restored file in the CVS history just from manual surgery. Um, and Edward did a really good job of, of putting together the Git migration script that preserved our history nicely there and figuring out all the new uh, all the new things that we needed collectively to know to make the transition relatively painless. We switched our registry format from an XML based thing to a binary, a custom binary format, which has had two effects. One, the registry got a bit smaller and faster to load. The other is it kicked out our XML2 dependency, um, per, uh, except for one feature that no one uses. So you can turn off the serialization ability to serialize a, a graph description to XML and build without XML2, which has been something that uh, the people using it in Embedded have cared about. So they, they really want to be doing subsetting. Um, we added the presets capability, which lets you drop in a file uh, in a home directory or into a global system location that sets a, a bunch of uh, presets, sets the properties that, for a particular element so that when you instantiate that element, instead of having to manually go and set bit rate and encoder parameters and all this stuff, you can just say, use the high quality preset for Theora and it will go and fiddle all those. Uh, we started on an element, uh, uh, brought an element called Playbin2 to usefulness. It's one of the higher level elements that encapsulates the whole idea of, of implementing a media player. So if you want to do a, if you want to play a video, uh, you can do it straight from the command line with a, so we have our command line GST launch. That's not even on the screen. Excuse me a second. Have our command line GST launch utility that lets you describe a, a GStreamer pipeline. And nice simple one. You go play bin two, URI equals. Get. Okay. So the nice thing about Playbin 2, it replaces an older element that is not surprisingly just called Playbin and adds new, a whole bunch of new functionality uh, including things like progressive downloading and um, another big one is it, it's more efficient in its memory usage because it buffers stuff as compressed video instead of uncompressed video and uh, provides better subtitle support, better multi-track support, uh, and, and some other things that are really starting to, to show up in Totem now. Totem uses Playbin 2 as its playback element. Is there a question? That was more, that's why Totem completely changed recently. Yes, one of the reasons Totem completely changed recently. So what else? We've added interlacing support in our caps so that we can now actually properly describe interlaced video, which means the elements can start learning how to handle it. And that's, again, starting to show up in the, the players. Uh, we've added the one that I've spent the most time on other than doing release management, which is GStreamer's DVD playback. is now, well, I think pretty capable and quite happy with it. Um, for example. This is just Totem, um, stock Totem, well, almost stock. It's, it's pulled straight from here. Languages. We've got uh, on-the-fly switching from AC3 to DTS 
decoders in the back end. DVD features, fancy sub picture support. I like this one. These, I like these anecdotes. The only only DVD I own that you, that uh, actually uses this feature of DVDs. So that's a subtitle. That uh, see, the only one I know that actually uses some of these wipe and uh, shape animated subtitles. I spent a lot of time on that one. I'm pretty happy that Viewstreamer can actually play DVDs now. Uh, we have these elements called App Source and App Sync that are utility uh, elements for allowing applications to connect uh, into a pipeline more directly. So they act as custom feed and custom output elements that simplify the task of interacting with a pipeline and are useful for things like for, uh, plug-in browser elements that are getting their data from somewhere else and want to feed it into a pipeline in a customized way. They can do their data fetching and then push it in through AppSource, get data back out at AppSync. We've had uh, extensive RTP and RTSP work that the, the Collabora guys do a lot of, so that's, that feeds into empathy and the, the telepathy framework to the point where probably people have noticed that uh, these days in, in Ubuntu, I'll just pop out of here for a bit, if you're running empathy. Then as soon as it comes online, There is absolutely no one there. Oh, there we go. So we've got, you know, these days you can do a video chat directly from your your uh, browser, from your, your instant messaging. And it is currently 10 to 3 in the morning there, so. <laughs> yes, good morning, Shard. Uh, HDV support that's, that's come from Edward's desire to do video editing. So he has a HDV camera. He's added in nice support for the high resolution HDV support. We've had uh, a Google Summer of Code project, I think two now, that have added in DVB support. I don't have a DVB card, so I can't, can't demo that. But it's, it's at the point now where you can nicely run a the channel scanning and, and watch TV from within Totem as well. And has features like um, time shifting and, and saving to disk. Can you split the multiplex? Not from Totem as far as I know. I think, I mean, if you save, you, I mean, you, can, you, you save one program from, from it if you save, if you, you save the one you're watching, you don't save the whole thing in Totem. It depends how far you want to split it. If you want to split the audio out, then... Well, I was more thinking drive for video, drive a video wall type display. Ah, right. From the single multiplex. Not, not straight out of the box with Totem. You could build that yourself with a, a graph that, that did that sort of thing. We've had a lot more uh, format support, lots of work on the, the multiplexers and uh, for producing output video, especially the MP transport stream production and, and MOV MP4, which are two formats we've traditionally been able to play but not been particularly good at, at producing as output formats. So there's been a lot of work in those, uh, again, as the result of some Google as Summer of Code students. Uh, lots, of, lots of video and audio filter work, especially audio effects plugins and, and video effects plugins in, and OpenGL effects stuff that has come through the, the Cheese photo booth app and, and, and its desire to have effects. And support for new formats, new 
uh, raw video formats, new encoded and video formats. I've added the GST plugins GL module and done the first releases of that, so that is a whole separate module that provides GStreamer with GL support. We've also seen appearing a lot more external plugin projects that aren't sort of within the, the camp. Um, DSP effects or um, yeah, companies that are selling DSPs, we've started hearing about them having their own GStreamer plugins, which is kind of encouraging in terms of community adoption uh, that people are doing these projects and, and we no longer need to be hearing from them day to day. We no longer need to see them all the time in the IRC channel. They're, they've got enough tools and enough examples that they're figuring it out on their own. Uh, in the next one, the Cairo XGL Hackfest was, is an interesting one that I'm, uh, hopefully will have some, some good fruit. So that was a, a meetup that we had in, in Barcelona in November with uh, Car Carl Worth and, and a bunch of GStreamer guys and, and some of the XGL um, and, and LibPixman guys getting all together in the in one room for a week to talk about video playback in general and what it needs from X or what it needs from, from the operating system and how and it, it, it was based on some proof of concept code that, that Benjamin Otte wrote where his, his basic premise was to teach Cairo about YUV based rendering formats and then allow Cairo to do, use it to do the video processing. So he, uh, I don't have that code installed, so I can't demo it. But the idea is we have an, a bunch of new elements that entirely use Cairo as their underlying rendering framework. And you can do your video scaling, color space conversion, rotations, arbitrary rendering, because it's just a Cairo context that you can make calls on. And that that would all then be fed through Cairo down to X and later accelerated through the GL backend to more or less offload a huge chunk of the, the work that we currently do in, in software, sometimes in hardware, but you know, all the things like subtitle rendering that we, that we do entirely in software would end up eventually going onto the graphics card. Um, so there's proof of concept code there waiting to, uh, to see, waiting to see some of the, the fruits of that hack vest trickle up from the X server and GL crowds. Um, uh, we added recently a, a frame stepping framework that you know does what you sort of expect it to do. Lets you do uh, single stepping on a. Let me just get out of there again. So this is our little test program that comes from the GST plugins base for doing testing various kinds of seeking. Example, you can skip through this video to somewhere in the middle and then step through it frame by frame. I can go backwards through it frame by frame. So this is, this is something that Totems wanted for years. You can do a half frame in, yeah, well, okay, so I can turn on the shuttle. It takes a little second to think about it. That's not working like it's meant to. This is pretty new code, and um, the other problem is that you have to get the sequence right, and frequently this little seek player doesn't get the sequence right for how you, how you do this. Or my preferred way to do this, which is this other little app that I wrote, Middle here somewhere. Pause it. Turn on the shuttle. Ah, excuse the deadlock. Excuse the deadlock, which I uh, haven't fixed yet. Oh, actually, I know how to fix that. No. Right. Pause it. Turn on shuttle. Laptop. 
Let it wait until it catches up a bit here. Because that's what accelerometers are for. <laughs> so, of course, the intention for that sort of thing is, is not to be using the accelerometer in light belt, but to be using some of these nice little jog controls that you can get, those USB devices that, that give you the same sort of capability in a, in a video editor. Scroll back and forth through the video. So, so that's all the background, right? That's where we get, that's where we are, that's where we get to today, more or less. We have a nice playback framework, somewhat capable of, of content production as well. It's being used in more and more apps and, and places. And the, the thing we're looking at as our next thought is, every time we've, we've gone from GStreamer 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. There's been this email that, that um, Christian Schaller, one of our longest term contributors, has sent to the mailing list saying, we're doing a major release. Is this the one we're going to call 1.0? And so far we've always said no. But the, the thing we sort of <laughs> looked at over the last, is, is that we've been doing 0 0.10 as our release series since 2005 now, without breaking API, without breaking ABI, without really wanting to change the, the underlying design, which was always the thing that, that people said no for. And in hindsight, really is pretty obvious that 0 0.10 could have been 1.0 if we just put the decimal point in a different spot and no one would have noticed. Um, but nevertheless, there are still some things that are, that are not that cool in 0 0.10. So, here we go. There's a bit of a pros and cons about why should we do a GStreamer 1.0. One of the reasons not to is 0 0.10 has been working exactly as it is for four and a half years. We've proved that we can add new features, uh, a whole bunch of them, a whole new set of plugins without apps really needing, they can use new API as they want, but apps that are only using the old subset, they don't break, they keep working. And so, shows that new stuff can be added without at any point needing to break everything. Another good reason not to is just changing the version number because, because we've, we're designed with parallel installability, the, the version number there is right in the, the binary, right in the, the library names. It's in a whole bunch of the paths. Just changing it to 1.0 it already causes a bunch of porting issues for apps. They either get left behind on 0 0.10 or they've already got to do a whole bunch of work to, well, maybe not a whole bunch, of, uh, at least a bit of work that, that app guys need to care about. And, and of course, there are the bigger issues of if we change the ABI and the API underneath, then they, they'll actually have to do porting work. Another reason is the, la the last time we did this, when we went from 0 0.8 to 0 0.10, we did a 0 0.9 in the middle where everybody stopped working on the, the 0 0.8 code base at all, and they went and worked on 0 0.9 for 18 months it was at, at the time, and nothing pretty much changed in 0 0.8. So the consumers of GStreamer were left with this decision, either we deal with no bug fixes and no improvements in 0 0.8, or we have to start following the, the painful development of 0 0.9 with, a, with no API and ABI guarantees. So we'd like to avoid that if we can. Um, another good reason not to is that people are expecting support for the 0 0.10 series. In some cases, they're paying for support for the 0 0.10 series. And starting a new thing probably means abandoning 0 0.10 at some point and just to have to think about how do those guys get their support if, if all the developers have moved on? It's a pretty normal thing for any, uh, any project, open source or not. Um, but having said all that, there are a bunch of good reasons that we do want to, to go ahead and do the, do the, make the jump. One of them is uh, there are still design flaws in the 0 0.10 series. There, there's a bunch of stuff that's hard to fix. Um, we, there's a bunch of API that 
we've already deprecated that it'd be nice to strip out so that we can remove code paths, removing code paths reduces bugs, makes things easier to test. Uh, there are some warts in the API, just uglinesses where someone had too much beer the night before when they designed the thing and then it made it into a release and we're stuck with it because we don't change our API and our API. And there's also, as I said, the symbolism of doing 1.0 after 10 years of, of major releases every little while and having the question be asked and answered no. Another, another good reason to think about it is that the, the switch to Git that I, I showed, Git makes a lot of the things that we were worried about when we were doing 0 0.8 to 0 0.10, we were doing it with CVS. And Git makes a lot of the, the, the development method we'd like to use easier because we can have multiple parallel branches and merge them in more simply than, than is just possible with, with CVS. So to give you a bit of an idea, some of the API we'd like to, to get rid of, there's a, the, this GST element get pad function, it's pretty esoteric stuff. Um, we have a method that's based on iterating pads now, because getting get element, a GST element get pad is an inherent raciness to it as, uh, for example, if you're playing, if you, if you start playing a new file, that creates a file source that gets plugged into a demuxer element and as the demuxer starts reading from the file, it starts creating multiple pads. Depending on exactly which moment you ask for a pad, it might or might not exist on the demuxer yet. Uh, the iterator method lets us get around some of that raciness, take a snapshot, only get exactly the pads that existed at that time. Uh, there's this, thing, this concept of stream time, store, which is to do with pausing and unpausing and retaining synchronization. We've come up with a better method. Uh, there's this GST controller API for uh, that's used by well, it's used by some surprising things. Uh, lets you control uh, the waveform of a, a a particular property on an element. It's, it's, it's in fact used by um, Rhythmbox. When you change the volume, it sets an envelope to a, to approach the new volume, and then GST controller steps it up to there. I showed you playbin 2, you know, our new playback element. You have a decode bin 2 as well, as a, uh, that's a, another piece inside that playbin uses. Uh, and because we have new ones and we don't change our API and ABI, we have old playbin, we have new playbin 2, old decode bin, new decode bin 2. It'd be nice to delete the old ones and have everybody move across. And some other stuff. There's a bunch of, li of RTP library APIs because the RTP stuff's been in such heavy development that they've gone through this. Um, this cycle of inventing new API they weren't happy with in microcosm. Uh, they've then been stuck with it because it went into a release and they have to maintain it. Uh, GST collect pads. There's a bunch of but ugly API. Uh, this monstrosity in our API called GST implements interface, which you call to find out if an object it currently implements an interface, because sometimes, for example, a audio mixer you have an element that, in, that provides a mixer interface, but if you open a particular sound card that doesn't have mixing, then, then what does it do? The answer they came up with five years ago that was a pretty bad one is you have to first call this other, element, this other interface that tells you yes or no that's currently available, depending, you know, it should be just a call in the in the interface that's actually being provided. The mixer should just have a, is mixer available right now, call. So stuff like that. Um, our tuner API for dealing with, with TV cards, pretty ugly. There's, there is a bunch of deficiencies, some of which we can fix in 0 0.10 without breaking API, but it, getting them right. So for a good example is the idea of adding strides to our video buffers. At the moment, Whenever a video buffer is passed around in GStreamer, there's sort of this implicit assumption of what the stride is based on the declared width of the video. So if you have a 351 pixel wide video, then in uh, 420 YUV color space, the actual stride might be 352 pixels because it's got to be rounded up to the nearest four. And it's not declared anywhere, it's just implicit in the, the buffers and it's kind of ugly um, and leads to a lot of bugs when you have an element that is silently implementing most strides correctly except when you go to an odd number or something like that and then 
you get weird stride issues. So it needs to be more explicit. We could put it in the caps, but then you need to very carefully go around making sure, because, you know, because we preserve all our API and our ABI and we don't want things breaking, you have to very carefully check what order you go and implement that in in various modules and add, set up the dependencies so that they have to have upgraded this before they can go running that. What happens if you end up with a new element that's implemented that talking to an element that hasn't, in, hasn't been updated yet? That stuff would be a lot easier if we just could have a break where everybody has to switch over to 1.0 and in 1.0 everything has been fixed and works. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff leaked into the API that should never have been made public, but again, someone might be using it, so we don't ever take that stuff out, uh, and that, again, that causes awkwardness. Uh, and in terms of, provide, of ABI, when we declare a structure, we, we at zero, at, when we released 0 0.10, we added some padding to the end of structures so that we could expand them with new fields while preserving our, our compatibility at the, at the binary level. But in some cases, some internal pieces of the GStream Recorder have changed sufficiently that we've run out of padding, and no one thought to add a, a private pointer as the last, the last piece of that padding. So in some cases, there's, there's, you know, we've painted ourselves into a corner. Uh, there are the usual fix me things and backwards compatibility behaviors that have been put in the, the core with a, a little comment saying, if we ever get around to breaking API, I'd really like to change this, but as it is, I've got to do this complicated thing. Um, so what else? Well, in 1.0, there's a bit of a desire in the community to make it easier for developers that are trying to use GStreamer. Uh, one of those is, is improving the installation experience on OS X and, and Windows. People currently end up compiling it um, themselves on Windows in particular and, and having to set up a full SIGWIN or Mozilla build thing it would be nice to provide a, so an installing executable that lets people start writing GStreamer apps. There are questions around that about how do you, uh, the, the usual sort of distribution pro questions of how do you make it simplest for people to install things and get going without bundling everything together into one executable that can't legally be distributed in half the world because of patent issues. You need, you know, it needs, still needs some kind of separation into a couple of different modules, and, and it, it also needs someone to come along and do the work. There's a desire to create some higher level helper libraries. For example, Totem has, I forget what it is, some large number of lines of code whose only job is, well, it, it's, it's Totem's implementation of a video widget for, uh, for the video playback. They can video widget. It's nearly 7,000 lines of code for for Totems. Just the video, the video play um, window portion of the of Totem. And whenever anyone implements a player on top of GStreamer, they end up implementing something like the Bacon Video Widget to take care of all the the higher level stuff that that sort of isn't handled by the the decoding framework. It's stuff about. What, what size do you create the window and how do you embed it in your, your widget toolkit? It'd be nice to have a simple GTK widget that takes care of all that sort of stuff for you. Another one is the, the, another piece of uh, internal API that a lot of application developers have to deal with is this concept of the GST bus, where you create a pipeline for processing some media and you get messages from it on the bus saying, I need an X window now, I've changed to pause state, I've changed to playing, or, or, or you know, I'm buffering video on, from the network. And the methods for doing that, the, there's this split of messages you can handle asynchronously in your, and you can just defer those until your uh, glib main loop or your Qt main loop and just poll periodically and find out, oh yeah, it's changed state, good, I can change the state of that button to show that it's paused or unpaused or whatever. And then there's these other ones that are synchronous messages that have to be answered uh, from whichever thread they are given to you, which is usually a background thread because GStreamer is heavily multi-threaded and does everything in the background. And things like, I need an X window to put my content into now, and you need to have an X window ready to give to it 
and you need to start caring about threading issues at that point, uh, which is something that we, we really try to avoid was the intention of the, the bus abstraction in the first place and it makes the abstraction a little bit leaky. Um, so there's a bit of a desire to improve that with something like a, a GST, a, a futures uh, or a system where you can handle everything from your glib main loop and the pipeline will wait if it needs to wait in some way that can be interrupted if you then go and do operations on the pipeline. So they, and that, that needs a bit of thought to get right so that you don't end up deadlocking uh, with the pipeline waiting for you to tell it something when you've just told it to pause and then you're waiting to see if it paused. Need to, it needs to be fairly carefully designed. Uh, one thing that I touched on here, sorry. Oh, great. So another one we touched on, it'd be nice to be able to hack without worrying about what API and ABI we're cha changing. It's one of the constant sort of low level drains on whenever you change something, what flow and effect is that going to have, especially in the core library dealing with state changes and things. Uh, thing, uh, moving plugins between modules is something that we only can do at the moment at release cycles. So if you have a, a, a plugin, you've gone and done a whole bunch of work on it in the GST plugins bad thing and you want to move it into the GST plugins good module so that distros are more comfortable with shipping it and, and it's flagged as good code, uh, that might take up to three months and 12, you know, it's only 12 weeks or 13 weeks, but th that can be a bit of a, a barrier and a pain to, to then figure out, all right, we can move that plug in there, but we've got to wait until base has come out so that it's not expecting it, or we've got to release both those tables together so that it, the plugin doesn't exist in two separate released things. Um, new features I'd personally like to see would be better use of hardware acceleration, like the VA API and VDP AU. Uh, decode, hardware decode acceleration libraries. We currently don't use them at all, so it's all software decoders or in some cases um, things that look like software decoders but actually do stuff in a DSP. And um, implementing some more base classes that make it easier to write GStreamer elements. So our proposal is we go and create a new Git playground for a 0 0.11 development cycle. We pull periodically from the 0 0.10 master into there so that it's basically a 0 0.10 without worrying about the API and ABI issues. And we invite people to create work in progress branches in the, that repository to demonstrate their ideas for 0 0.11 or you know, 1.0 eventually. In the meantime, we keep developing 0 0.10. Anything that can be done, in, obviously, in an API, ABI compatible way, you just do in the 0 0.10 branch and then it gets pulled across by the periodic merging. And that eventually, when we have enough interesting things going on, we pull the work in progress branches together and call that a 0 0.11 release, do a few of those, end up with a GStreamer 1.0 in time for GNOME 3.0 next in, in September of this year. That's the, the basic plan. And that's quarter past, so any questions? Yeah, so we have time for maybe one or two quick <laughs> questions if, if there are any. Okay, well, thank you, Jan, very much.